Well, good morning, guys. Welcome back to Virtual Team. Um, we are going to be in this format for the foreseeable future. Uh, our church leadership is talking about opening up midweek ministries. We're opening up our weekend ministries. But for team, for the, for the next month or so, I think we'll be in this format. So just stay tuned, and I'll let you know when we're going to change back to in-person meetings. Uh, even with the news uh, out of Washington this week, um, I hope that all of you had a chance to have a great uh, Christmas, great New Year, some time uh, away from work, some time with family some time to reflect, as I mentioned in the email. Uh, but we're glad to be back meeting here virtually, and let's get started. Here's our story for the day. A prince was put under a spell so that he could speak only one word each year. If he didn't speak for a whole year, the following year he could speak two words, and so on. One day he fell in love with a beautiful lady. He refrained from speaking for two whole years so he could call her, My Darling. But then he wanted to tell her he loved her, so he waited three more years and said, finally, I love you. And at the end of these five years, he decided he wanted her to marry him, uh, so he waited another four years. And finally, as the ninth year of silence ended, he led the ladies to the most romantic place in the entire kingdom. And then using the nine words he was now allowed, he said, my darling, I love you. Will you marry me? And the lady said, pardon? Pardon? I'll be here every Friday morning, guys, just for you. Our team theme this year is Men of the Word, 26 verses every man should know. And we're covering the whole story arc of the Bible from Genesis to the book of Revelation, sort of one verse at a time, one key verse at a time. So you get the story and understand the trajectory. We set a rather ambitious goal of memorizing one verse every week, and sometimes a bonus verse. And we did that because sort of the theme verse of our year is in Psalm 119.11, which says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we want to memorize Scripture and get it from our heads to our hearts. 2 Timothy 3.16 also says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, which is a good description of what we do right here at TEAM. Now let me give you a very quick Cliff Notes summary of where we've been in our first 12 weeks. Remember Cliff Notes from college is kind of how I got through. We began in Genesis with the creation of all things. Uh, then came humanity's fall into sin and brokenness and distance from God. Then God made a promise to a man named Abraham. The promise to bring salvation to the world through a people. And he would be the father of that people and then comes the story of the ancient nation of Israel. We see God's sovereign plan worked out in real history through a real people, through all the good, bad, and ugly that happens throughout the Old Testament. Then come the prophets, uh, the prophets who reminded Israel of God's word, who reminded them of God's promise to send a Messiah, a Savior who would redeem all sin by becoming the sacrifice himself. We talked about substitutionary atonement in Isaiah. And then we jumped to the New Testament uh, a few weeks ago and saw the fulfillment of that promise through the birth of Christ, what we call the incarnation as the Word became flesh. And then the last time we met, session 12, we looked at the shortest verse in the whole Bible, which all of you I'm sure have memorized by now, and that was simply John 11:35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. We saw that Jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, but he also wept over the sin and brokenness of the world, just as many of us felt like weeping when we saw what was happening in Washington, D.C. just this week. Our bonus verse uh, in week 12 was 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And that's the promise. And today is session 13, and I've called this session simply Resurrection. Now, the movie clip we're going to look at today is from uh, a film called Risen. I've used clips from this film before. It came out a few years ago. And it's, uh, it's the story of a Roman soldier and how he uh, slowly, over time, comes to faith in Christ. Now, the scene you're going to see takes place uh, the day after the crucifixion. And he has been assigned by Governor Pontius Pilate the, the, the job of finding uh, the body of Jesus of Nazareth. And so this is the scene. Uh, take a look. 
Like I said, it's a pretty good film made by a secular movie company, and I enjoy uh, any effort to, uh, that helps me try to imagine what that ancient world was like, what that moment was like uh, when uh, one comes face to face with a resurrected Lord. Our verse for today is just a few verses after uh, the verse we looked at last time, Jesus wept in the same chapter, John 11, and here it is. John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I'm going to talk about three things out of this verse. First, the necessity of resurrection. The necessity of resurrection. When our boys were young, um, like probably many of you in your house, we went through several levels of pets. We eventually got a dog, a Labrador Retriever, but on the way toward the dog, we tried all kinds of smaller pets. We had lizards and hamsters, a turtle they found in the backyard, and a number of goldfish. Uh, But we had a weird problem uh, keeping the goldfish alive. Uh, They would last a couple of weeks, and then we'd find them floating in the fish tank, and then we'd go and have a bathroom burial at sea, if you know what I mean, and we'd start over again. I'd go back to the pet store and buy another goldfish for like $2.99, and it would happen all over again. Uh, and we must have gone through that cycle three or four times at least. And finally, when I was going back to the, the pet store to get a, a goldfish, I noticed that they had a, 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 they had a more expensive goldfish for sale uh, that was like $5.99, But this model uh, came with a replacement guarantee. That is, if the goldfish died for any reason, you just had to bring the goldfish back to the store in a little plastic bag, and you get a free replacement goldfish. I thought, cool, problem solved. I'll simply upgrade my goldfish and never have to buy another one. So sure enough, a couple weeks later, that goldfish died too. So I put it in a little plastic bag and took it back to the store, and boom, got a brand new goldfish. Now, after this happened another time or two, I decided that the truth was uh, we just weren't a very safe place for goldfish. We weren't very good at keeping them alive. And that's when we went with the hamster. But wouldn't it be nice, I thought, that if life came with a replacement guarantee, or maybe it does, I did over the holiday break during those two weeks, two and a half weeks, I did four separate funerals of different kinds. Some in a funeral home, some at church, some just in a cemetery by a gravesite. And nothing will convince you more of the necessity of resurrection than standing by an open grave with a family who is grieving a loved one. Now, over the years, I've done so many of these, I've learned that when it comes to, when it comes to death, when it comes to looking at a loved one lying in a casket, Almost everyone, even people who don't believe a lick in God, everyone believes in some form of resurrection or another. They might believe in reincarnation. They might believe in aliens. They might believe in beer. I mean that. I did one uh, funeral for a couple. It was a tragic accident. And um, after we were all done, before they closed the lid on the mother, the woman, uh, one of her adult sons, came running in from the parking lot with a small cooler in which he had two ice-cold Bud Lights. He took them out and he tucked them in the casket with his mom before they shut the lid with tears running down his face because that's what they loved to do together. People need hope so much, they need to believe in resurrection so much that they will create their own theology, their own belief belief system, just to find that hope. And that's why, for example, when a celebrity dies, we hear people say all kinds of, you know, just pretty dumb things, like when Kobe Bryant died last January, just about a year ago. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, his former teammate, said, among other things, he said, Kobe's the MVP of heaven, he said. Now, one of my sons and I were watching TV together when we saw him say that, and my son sort of slyly glanced at me and said, hmm, wouldn't that be Jesus? The problem with all these personal theologies is that they have no no basis, no foundation, no authority, no proof, no evidence, and as a result, there is no certain hope. It's just wishful thinking. 
And that leads us to the second point I want to bring out. That's the truth of resurrection. The truth of resurrection. If we go back to the movie for just a moment, Risen, the central character is a Roman tribune named Clavius. He's played by Joseph Fiennes. Uh, And he's in the service of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Now, Clavius is a fictional character. He's the one the movie is about. Pontius Pilate, however, is a real historical character. Shows up in the biblical record, shows up in Roman history. Uh, He's a real guy. Clavius in the movie has one job. He's a professional soldier. He has one job. Find the body of freshly executed Jesus of Nazareth who was uh, executed on the cross just the day before. Put to rest the crazy rumors about this supposed holy man. He's got the full authority and power of the Roman Empire at his disposal. The Nazarene was crucified in public in the place where the Romans typically executed all their victims. All he had to do is find the body of one dead Jew. Spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the movie yet, he couldn't do it. Couldn't find him. And when he did find him, what he found is Jesus was alive. That was the scene we, I showed you. Now, let's think just a minute on the historical level. Ancient Jerusalem uh, was not a very big place. I've been to Jerusalem. It's not a great, huge place even today. But uh, 2,000 years ago, it was not very big at all. Population of about thirty to 40,000 people, roughly the pop. <coughs> excuse me, the population of any one of the Tri-Cities. It covers some 220 acres, about one square kilometer, which is about one-fifth the size of the town of Geneva. So it's a small place. In fact, to walk from where Jesus was tried before Pilate to where he was crucified would be like walking from here, the Kessinger campus, down down Kessinger Road to our South Street campus, seven-tenths of a mile away. That's about what it was. So how is it that all the power of Rome, all the power of the Jewish ruling council could not find Jesus' body? How how is that possible? There have been a number of arguments or explanations uh, other than the biblical story throughout the the centuries. And let me just tick off a couple of them for you. Some say, well, they they probably just, just lost it or they forgot where he was buried. They went to the wrong cemetery, the wrong tomb. I've always said that's like forgetting where JFK is buried. It's kind of ridiculous. Some say, well, the disciples uh, stole the body and then created the mythology of resurrection. Okay, let's, let's just imagine for a second that that's true. It means that these 11 men who were so terrified that they'd be next after Jesus on the cross, that they would be there next, who were hiding out in a single room together, let's say they made, as they hid out, an elaborate plan in one day Uh, to invent a brand new religion. And all they had to do was then go to the tomb, overpower armed, trained Roman guards, roll away the giant stone, steal Jesus' dead body, bury it where no one in 2,000 years has been able to find it, then create the fictional story that he had raised from the dead. And then manage to keep that secret for the rest of their lives, even though most of them were tortured and executed for this very claim. Don't you think that just one of them, just one, when threatened with being coated with tar and burned alive or threatened with being beheaded or hung upside down on a cross till dead, you don't think even one of them would say, oh, you mean that body? He's in my backyard. I think that would have happened. Or maybe there's what I call the princess bride explanation. That is that Jesus never really died. He was only mostly dead. He didn't die, he only passed out temporarily, and they thought he was dead. And then somehow, he managed to endure the Roman scourging, which by itself killed many men, carry a heavy wooden beam nearly a mile, have nails driven through his hands and his feet, suffer blood loss trauma, a spear thrust through his lungs and pericardium, and then was placed in a tomb for 36 hours with no food in the water, and then revived enough to single-handedly push aside a two-ton boulder and then overwhelm a squad of armed Roman guards and disappear into history. Okay, then, if you believe that. Or maybe there's the mass hallucination theory that because of their grief, all the disciples had a common hallucination of a resurrected Jesus. The New Testament claims that the resurrected Christ appeared to the women first, and by the way, That's a good argument for the genuineness of the story because in the ancient world, no one making up a story would have made women the first witnesses of the resurrection because they were not seen as credible at that time. 
But there was the women, then the disciples, and eventually to over 500 people at one time. The New Testament was then written by several of these eyewitnesses, and the church was born and continues to grow to this day, 2,000 years later. You simply can't explain all of that as being imaginary. Now, the resurrection of Jesus, to me, is not only the central claim of the Christian faith, and it is, it's one of the most historically verified events of the ancient world. It's the watershed of all human history, and it promises a certain hope for those who believe. And that leads me to the third thing I want to talk about, and that's the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. Let me take you back to my freshman year in college, which was 1974. Hard as that to believe. And on my freshman floor, uh, there, was, there were 27 of us, and one of the guys was named Charlie. Uh, I'd never met him before. He, I forget where he came from, but his name was Charlie. And Charlie was a great guy. He was a fun guy. He was smart. Uh, but he was what we called at the time uh, a party animal. That is, uh, Charlie um, liked to drink. He, he uh, liked to cuss. He smoked funny-smelling cigarettes. Uh, in other words, he did all the things that I had been taught my whole life not to do. Uh, now, I was a follower of Christ at the time. I was a believer, but I was rather, rather timid about my faith I certainly wasn't outward toward Charlie. I certainly didn't talk to Charlie about faith. In fact, if you had asked me, I would have said, you know, save your breath. Charlie is kind of beyond hope. Well, fast forward some 15 years. And some of you have heard me tell this story before. Fast forward some 15 years. I had forgotten about Charlie and, and moved on in my life and called the ministry and all that. But one day I got the alumni magazine uh, for my school, which I get, I think they send out four every year. And I always just flip through to the class notes section to see if I recognize uh, anything that's happened to one of my friends or one of the people who used to be my friends in college. And I noticed this little paragraph under the class of 1978 that said that Charlie uh, had begun his first term as a Wycliffe Bible translator. I almost fell off the chair in my kitchen. I started yelling for my wife. She didn't know Charlie. She didn't even know me back in those days. I said, Lorraine, Lorraine, come here. You got you to see this. This is Charlie. This is Charlie. He, he's a missionary. Charlie had become a missionary, a Bible translator. And then I remembered, for some reason, that he had been an English major while we were in college. I spent several years trying to get in touch with him and couldn't because he was serving in a very sensitive, dangerous part of the world. Finally, I did get in touch with him through email, <coughs> and I told him that I was now a pastor, and I wanted to hear his story. I wanted to hear how God got hold of his life. And so he emailed me back, and he shared um, how he had come to personal faith in Jesus a few years after college, and then he felt called to serve in Bible translation. And then Charlie wrote in that email, he wrote, Who would have thought God could use a couple of schlubs like us? He said, like us. And I laughed out loud again because Charlie had just called me a schlub like him. And he was right. He was right. The power that changed Charlie's life is the same power that called me into ministry. It turned me from a, a, a shy, timid, um, sort of unheard witness to Jesus to someone who preaches every week publicly from God's Word. The same power is the power that burst from the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago. It's flowed down through the centuries and into the hearts and lives of believers all over the world. It's the power of the resurrection. It's the power of new life. It's the power that Jesus has to transform us from death to life, spiritual death to spiritual life. Our memory verse for this week, I'll go over it again, John 11, 25 and 26. It's actually two verses, so I'm putting them both together as the verse and bonus verse. Jesus said to her, this is one of Lazarus' sisters. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. If you're meeting to, in a Zoom session uh, after this or you're going to meet with guys later, here's the two questions I want you to go uh, through. In your booklet, there's just one question, and it says, Christianity is not about becoming a better person. Christianity is about death and resurrection. I'd like you to respond to that statement. 
Christianity is not about becoming a better person. It's about death and resurrection. First of all, what do you think that means? What does it mean to you personally? And I'm going to add a question. If you have time, consider this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, <coughs> excuse me, Paul writes, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He's saying that without the resurrection, the Christian faith is useless and empty. Why would Paul, of all people, say this? So have a conversation about those things, and if it goes in other directions, that's fine too. Uh, let's take a moment and pray. Uh, I want to remind you, you can always send prayer requests to me via email. Uh, you can send them in response to the email I send you every week. And my email is bcoffee at chapelstreetchurch.com. And we'll pray for them uh, when we record this session. But let's pray, and then we'll uh, wrap things up. So let's, let's pray, guys. Lord, I want to thank you for your word today, as always. We thank you for bringing us back together here, for giving us this track to run on, uh, studying your word, uh, memorizing your word, putting it into our hearts. We thank you for what we covered today, that uh, while we might invent all sorts of hope, we might try to find hope in different things, we all need real hope. And real hope is found in the truth and power of your resurrection. We don't have to wonder about what's going to happen to us. We don't have to, to, say, to say crazy things and put our faith in strange things. We can put our faith in your resurrection, the power to change our lives, to bring us from, life, from death to life. Lord, we also pause to think about all the news we're seeing from Washington this week. Um, some of us feel angry, some feel sad, some feel uh, fear, all kinds of things. Uh, we know you are sovereign over all these things, over nations and governments and presidents, and we trust you. And we ask you simply to call us and strengthen us to have the courage and the grace to love our neighbor as ourself, and be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Uh, thanks for all these things in your name. Amen. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. Have a great week.